I'm sure some of you will be surprised to see that I have, apart from my digital Bible, carry this along because I have multiple Bibles in it. There's one version of the Bible I do not have in it. And so I came with a hard copy of it. Okay? Um, it is called the Tanakh. The Tanakh. Which is the holy scriptures in the Jewish language. Translated into English, of course, okay? The Jewish Bible is called the Tanakh. And it's titled The Holy Scriptures. And I'm bringing it here because I want to read some portions of scripture today in the Tanakh so that we can understand some of what I'm trying to get across. The title of my sermon today I have called it, Make It Smoke, and it has a rider. The title is Make It Smoke, and the rider is Consumed by Passion. Consumed by Passion. So, Make It Smoke, dash, Consumed by Passion. Let's turn to start with, by turning to Leviticus chapter 3, Leviticus chapter 3, and I'm going to read from verse number 12, verse 12, Leviticus chapter 3, verse 12, Leviticus chapter 3, verse 12. And I'm going to read it first in the New King James. I'll read it first in the New King James. And then I'm going to read it in the Tanakh. Leviticus chapter 3 from verse 12. And if his offering is a goat, the whole of Leviticus chapter 3, chapter 4, I'm talking about various types of offering. In fact, it started from Leviticus chapter 1. So, chapter 3 is talking about peace offering. Okay? I don't know how many of us have taken time to go through this offering uh, portion of the scriptures. It could make for very tedious, difficult, or boring reading. Okay? And if you go through the details, you will see how thankful it is that we are not required again to do all this tedium of, you know, uh, preparing offering to God this way. It, and if his offering is a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on his head and kill it before the tabernacle of meeting. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle his blood all around on the altar. Then he shall offer it, offer from it his offering as an offering made by fire to the Lord. The fat that covers the entrails, that's the intestine, the inner portions of it, and all the fat that is on the entrails, the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove, and the priest shall burn them on the altar as food, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma. All the fat is the Lord's. So why am I reading this portion to us? Normally, they will take the, the animal, they will cut its neck, remove the blood into a basin, like you really sprinkle it on the altar. And then, of course, they're supposed to carefully remove all the fat. And you can see how detailed God went into explaining where the fat should be taken from. Most of the fats that goes into our, our bodies, we begin to add them around our middle, around all the sides. And then they come down to the side of the legs and the muscles. And God described all the organs and all the places that absorb all this fat. And he says they should cut out all the fat. It didn't just end with the last statement. You see, the last statement in verse 16 says, all the fat is the Lord's. He could have just simply said that, isn't it? But he went into detail by explaining where all the fat normally are accumulated and stored. And it, telling them, it was telling them they should get all those fat out. 
and then they should burn them by fire for sweet aroma. It says all the fat is the Lord's. The next verse, verse 17, says, This shall be a perpetual statute. Throughout your generations, in all your dwellings, you shall eat neither fat nor blood. So they are instructed, they were instructed, and that instruction, of course, we believe, continues on to us today, to not eat fat and not eat blood. Of course, you know, fat makes food sweet, isn't it? It's the fatty things that makes food sweet and palatable and delicious. But God, who knows the danger of such, told us not to eat fat. Now, what am I getting into? If you put fat on the fire, when we go to the feast, we used to have what is called um, family fun day. And on those family fun day, some of the singles and some members will put together money and they will get goats. And then we will kill the goats and then they will roast it and make a swan. The number of times I've been around when they are making those things. And those who do barbecue also know how that is. As you cut out the meat, Anyone that you have fat that you did not remove all the fat from it, when you put it on the fire, if the fire is burning, if it is meat alone, meat will burn and become black like charcoal, carbon based. It will burn and become black like charcoal, leaving a black gristle on the grill. But the ones that have fat, what happens to the fat? It will melt, it will drop into the fire. The fire will burn more, and then there are plenty of smoke. In fact, smoked meat, smoked chicken, or smoked food, some chef will tell you that the smoke that permeates that meat is part of the flavor, the aroma that makes it wonderful. There was a time when my wife had a penchant for going to buy smoked chicken. And I'm like, what is the Disney with this smoked chicken? So it has a special taste. Now, if you have watched people doing that as well, I see the guy who is our, unfortunately is not around, the chief Asu specialist. He would take oil or fat, and he would drop it and sprinkle it on the meat, and the thing will fizzle, shh, it will melt. It will make the fire burn, and then you'll see lots of smoke. So by burning the fat, the fat doesn't burn and become charcoal to leave a residue. It is totally burnt up, completely burnt up. It only, not just only burns up, it also releases smoke into the air. Now here's where my title comes from. Every time in the scriptures, when you read, you shall burn it as a sweet smelling aroma. When you use the word burn the fat, in the Bible, in the Jewish language, the word used is actually make it smoke. It's like saying when you are offering sacrifice to God, God told the Jews, you need to remove all the fat, and as you are burning it, you must burn them. Actually, it means make your sacrifice smoke. If your sacrifice doesn't smoke, then your sacrifice is not acceptable. Let's read a, a few portions of it, and we'll see where that that is in the Bible, all right? Um, we'll see where that is. Every time he says, burn it, it's actually talking about let it smoke. God requires that they must let the smoke of their sacrifice go up to him. What is the significance of it? Why does he want the smoke to go up to him? Why did he say get all the fat, the ones that is the sweet part, the one that adds sweetness to the meat. You know, meat that has some fat in it is a bit sweeter than the one that's just raw, flat meat. That's why people like Ishan. That's why they like all those juicy bokoto and abodi and all the rest of them that has all the fat in it. Because as you are eating them, the raw, lean meat is sometimes not that palatable. Just eating, it's like sometimes eating fiber. But with the fat in it, it's more sweet. But God says, cut out all the fat, burn them to me. It's like, all the good parts of it. Burn it and let the smoke come up to me as a sweet melon aroma. How important is this to God? Let's find out. We'll see how important it is to God. First Samuel chapter 2. 
First Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, let me read this in the Tanakh. I'm going to read this in the Tanakh. First Samuel chapter 2, from verse 12. First Samuel chapter 2, from verse 12. Okay. And you see how important it is that the sacrifice smokes. From verse 12. I'm going to read it from the Tanakh, from the Jewish Bible. Now, Eli's sons were scoundrels. They paid no heed to the Lord. This is how the priests used to deal with the people. When anyone brought a sacrifice, the priest boy would come along with a three-pronged fork while the meat was boiling. And he would thrust it into the cauldron or the kettle or the great pot or the small cooking pot. And whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take away on it. This was a practice at Shiloh with all the Israelites which came there. So God didn't tell the Israelites to burn all the meat on the altar. You will see. He told them they should actually burn the fat. But the meat part of it, the priests even actually are the ones who consume it. Okay? God is not greedy in the sense. I want to use that word. But let's continue reading. Anyway. But verse 15. Even before the sweat was turned into smoke. That's verse 15 of seconds of, of uh, 1 Samuel 2, verse 15. Let me read this in New King James. The New King James, which you probably have, says, Also, before they burn the fat, anywhere in your Bible you read about sacrifice, I'm talking about burning the fat. The word in Hebrew is, any, before they make it smoke, or make it smoke. Anywhere you read burn the fat, it's simply saying, the word is, make it smoke. Make it smoke. Verse 15. But even before the sweat was turned into smoke, the priest boy would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, hand over some meat to roast for the priest, for he won't accept boiled meat from you, only raw. So before they will cut out all the fat, so that they can actually burn those things and the smoke will go up and acceptable to God, so that the raw lean meat they cannot take. Those ones will say, no, we, won't, we don't want that. The one they will be boiling actually will have been devoid, you know, all the fat will have been removed. And they will have burned it or they will have made it smoke up, go up to God. Consume totally, all the fat totally consumed. Hand over some meat to roast for the priest, for he won't accept boiled meat from you only roast. 16. And if the man said, let them first turn the sweat into smoke, and then take as much as you want, he will reply, no, hand it over at once, or I will take it by force. The sin of the young men against the Lord was very great, for the men treated the Lord's offering impiously. So before the meat was made to smoke, before they would cut off all the fat and burn it, let it be consumed, go up as a sweet smelling aroma to God, those people want to take their own. What has this got to do with anything? What has it got to do with us? You remember I said, it is make it smoke and consumed by passion, okay? Is the title of today. The reason is this. What did Jesus Christ come to do? To offer himself as a sacrifice for us, right? What is our responsibility towards God in the book of Romans 12? We should offer ourselves up to God as a living sacrifice. Remember, any sacrifice that doesn't smoke, where all the fat, the good parts, are offered and consumed of totally to God, is not a sacrifice that's acceptable to God. To keep and take part of the fat, Away, before offering to God, is dishonoring God. And that sacrifice is, not, not, is nothing to God. Brethren, that smoke, that consuming fat that is burnt up, is like the passion or the zeal that we have for God in our worship. A lot of us have faith in God. It is what made many Christians choose to step out and walk away from certain lifestyles. Make sacrifices in various ways for what they believe. But our worship of God, our faith in God, 
is transformed and made great when we have passion. And that not just have passion little, but when it consumes us. When the passion is total, it consumes us. If we don't give the best that we have, which is all that is important to us, and willing to give it all wholeheartedly to God, then our sacrifice, our worship to God, of God, is not smoking. Is there any part of us that is really important, that we feel we cannot give to God? You know, for various people, it differs, right? Remember the fat is the part that makes food sweet. And God said, cut it out and offer it to me. So the most important aspect of our life should be, God, should be given to God. And God constantly is looking for those who will give up that which makes their life the best in, in their eyes. And they're willing to burn it up and let it smoke to him. Look at the example of Abraham. What was Abraham's, in quotes, what was the fat in Abraham's life? He wanted a son. He had everything. But all he had, his wealth, his servants, his fame, to Abraham, they were not important. Remember, he kept praying to God. There was a time he prayed to God and said, God, please, give me a son. The one who's going to be a, here in my house is my slave, Leazar of Damascus. And God told him, don't worry, you have your own child. He fervently wanted that son. That was the most important thing he wanted. And then God gave him a son. And obviously, imagine having a son at the age of a hundred. Overjoyed. And then God said, take your son. Your only son, whom you loved. Abraham already had faith in God. Didn't we know that? Because God told him, leave your people, he left. Go into a land I will show you. And he was following. Stop here, he will stop. Pitch your tents here. Walk before me and I will do this for you. Everything God kept telling him, he believed. He believed in God and the scripture says it was credited to him as righteousness. So that was good faith. But his faith needed to be transformed into living faith. And that is only possible when we are willing to take what might be the fat in our lives and offer it up to God and let it be consumed totally by our love and our passion for him and his things. And God told him, it's like take, take all the fat from your life and offer it up to me when he told him to take Isaac and kill him. And what did Abraham do? He took Isaac, and in his mind, the guy was dead. He was bringing the knife down when God stopped him. He said, do not touch him. Abraham was willing to actually make him smoke. He had faith already. But passion that consumed him, knowing that this is God, he is worthy of my worship, I should be willing to give him everything. I should be willing to give up everything for him. Things that I value as important. If it comes between me and God, is it the desire to get married? Is it the desire to have a child? Is it the desire to build a house? Is it the desire to meet my basic needs like eating food, morning, afternoon, and evening, to clothe myself? If I have to put that on the line for my passion or for my zeal, to do that which God has asked of me. Will I do it? Will I burn those facts on the altar of my worship for God? Or will I say, you know what? I need to give God all of this, but this one, I won't give him. I can't give him. You know, God, you know I just love you. But you know, when it comes to this portion, I mean, the fat around this kidney, the fat around this, you know, this body, I'm sorry, I, that's my special favorite. I will give you everything, but I just can't give you this one. The fat must be burnt up and consumed. You know, Jesus Christ was quoting Psalm 69, verse 9. When David said, because the zeal for your house has eaten me up, it has consumed me. He said, and the reproaches of those who reproach you are falling on me. When Jesus entered the temple and saw them, 
selling and buying and doing those kind of things in the temple. And it upturned everything. I'm sure you know Jesus Christ did not go there and say, Ha, ah, people of God, why are you doing this in God's house? Please, 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 take your money and take, no, 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 this is not right. Take your money, take your things, please, please go outside and do those who are outside. Is that how you think he was? No. Remember, he was a carpenter for 30 years. Building houses, cutting wood in a land where the floor is often made of rocks. So he will have built muscle that will put Paul to put to shame. I mean, in terms of how strong he was. And he will carry a temple and upturn it. He said he took wind, he flung them. And the disciples remember. What did they remember? Oh, it has been written that zeal, passion for the, for the Lord's house, has consumed you. Our faith becomes mediocre, becomes just not valuable if we do not let it consume us. If we don't have this passion for the things of God, for the will of God, for the word of God, for the house of God, that passion must consume us. That is when our worship, our sacrifice to God, our living for God is actually smoking. When we are consumed by zeal, when we are consumed by passion for God's things. Let's turn to again, Leviticus chapter 7, and read from verse 8. Leviticus 7, verse 8. Leviticus 7, verse 8. I'm reading from the Tanakh. So too, the priest who offers a man's burnt offering shall keep the skin of the burnt offering that he offered. For that, any meal offering that is baked in an oven and any that is prepared in a pan or a girdle shall belong to the priest who offers it. But every other meal offering mixed with oil mixed in or dry shall go to the sons of Aaron all alike. God didn't ask that all the sacrifices should be given to him. He still had things that were for the priests. God didn't say, I want everything that you want, everything that is good for you. He wants the best that we have to give. But we have to give it to him willingly. But he asks of it. He still made allowance for us. He still is ready to bless us. He's the one who says, it's my father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's the one who said his plans for us are good plans. He says them before we ask. He knows what we need. So it's not as if he wants us to suffer. No. He just wants us to give him the best. He is already going to give us the best we want. And he can give us the best that we need. More than we even think we know. So he's not a God who is asking for everything. But he wants the best. And he wants it to be totally given to him without reservation. Totally without reservation. Let's read what it says in 1 Peter 3.15. This is an instruction that Paul, I mean Peter, you know, was inspired to give unto us. 1 Peter 3.15. In the New King James it says, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Set apart the Lord God in your heart. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Always be ready. But it says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. So for us to be able to actually give our best to God, He needs to be in a special place in our heart. We need to recognize who He is, what He wants from us, and how we are in relation to Him. And be willing to say, you know, this is, this is what I want to do. But then God says, this is what I want. This is, this is the, okay, he is God. He deserves to be given this. We give it to him. Because he's in a special place in us. Nothing else comes before him. Nothing else comes apart from his, him being supreme. In Deuteronomy 6, it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your being. He needs to be first. We need to be consumed 
by passion for the things of God. The rest of this sermon, I want to speak of five areas we can make it smoke in our lives. Areas in our lives that we can have a passion for God. Areas in our lives where we can give the best we have and put our energies, zeal, and everything into God. Five areas that we can make it smoke in our life, where we can be consumed by passion for the things of God. The first one, the first one, in the things we do, in the way we react, in the way we relate, in the way we respond to people around us. The scripture has instructions in Matthew 5, 6, 7, the Olivet Prophecy, on how those who are God's children should respond, how they should act, and how should they should do, how they should do things. Oftentimes when we read these things, they're not that easy for us to follow. It's like the fat on the offering that is the part that makes it interesting and palatable. It's like the priest who said, no, I don't want the raw meat. I don't want the lean one that you have already removed all the fat. I want the one that still has the fat in it. And when we look at things the way God wants us to act, the things He wants us to do, they're like, they're not that difficult. Like they're not that easy. I'll give you examples. Love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. How is that easy to do? Someone you know is not good to you. Someone you know is constantly looking out for your bad. And the Bible says, it didn't say don't hate them. So it's easy to say don't hate your enemy. Well, I don't hate this person. But I also don't like this person. No, it actually says love your enemies. It's a verb. And it says pray for them as well. In fact, elsewhere in the Bible, in the, I think it's in Hebrews, it says when your enemy is hungry. It didn't say when you see him eating, put sand in his food. Or it didn't say when you see him eating, don't put sand in his food. Let him eat his food in peace. It actually is when he is hungry. Give him food. Now, how is that easy to do? How is that easy to do? I've had people argue and get angry and annoyed at the concept that we are supposed to pray for enemies. Pray for my enemies, get. Hey, if I keep praying for my enemies, don't you think by now I will have died finished? They will have killed me finished now. Ah, in fact, I will continue to curse them, somebody was saying. Why should I pray for them? Ah, in fact, God should destroy them and kill them finished. So I will pray for them so that they will continue to get better. And then they will continue to do me what I beg. I don't want. Those are difficult things we should consider. The scripture says that I will allow myself to be cheated rather than take my brother before the courts of unbelievers. Do not withhold from him who will borrow from you if it's in your power to do so. The Bible talks about, in Matthew 25, those who Jesus will say, I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was in prison, and you visited. Those are things we do, is it not? So we need to have this passion to look at the things God expects us to do, the way he wants us to live, the way he wants us to respond to one another. The way he wants us to react and the way he wants us especially to relate and have a passion for working towards them that we can perfect them. We need to have that passion, that zeal. See, faith without passion becomes like sacrifice without smoke. Faith without passion is like sacrifice without smoke. Let me give you an example. And anyone can have passion. But if you have your passion and you add it to your faith in God, then your faith becomes great and God has always been moved to value and react and act to reward faith and passion mixed together. Let me give you two quick examples on that before I move to the next one. Remember the story, I think it's sold somewhere in the book of Luke. I think I have it in my notes here. 
there were some friends, four friends, who had a friend who was paralyzed and sick. And they knew Jesus Christ was a healer. And they all knew, these four friends and their friend who was paralyzed, that if we go to that man, Jesus Christ, he will heal you of this sickness. Maybe it was the man who convinced them and pleaded with them, his friends, please, take me to meet this guy. And I know he will have, part, will have mercy on me and heal me. I've seen or I've heard stories and accounts of all he's been doing. And I know he's the son of God. Please take me there. And the four friends took him on the pallet. And by the time they came to the house, we know the story, right? What happened? <laughs> there was no way to enter. There were so many people there. One, do they have faith in Christ to heal them? They have faith. Did they believe he could heal them? Or oh, they believe he could heal them? Did they act on their faith? They did. They came all the way. And then there were so many people there. Ah, we tried though. Oh boy. We really tried for you. We're so sorry. Let's try again tomorrow. What did they do? See, faith with passion. Their passion made them go to the roof. They removed the tiles on the roof and they lowered him down. Christ saw it. What did they say? Your faith has made you well. That faith mixed with passion. His friends had faith. He had faith. It combined with passion and it became great. The second story is the story you also know, the Syrophoenician woman, whose child was demon-possessed. And she believed Jesus Christ could do something about it. And she came to Christ. That was faith. But you see, it was also backed by passion. It was all consuming. And you see what passion does. Passion discounts everything else and makes faith really hot. So faith without passion makes our worship or sacrifice of God useless. It becomes mediocre. When she came to Christ, you know disciples were shunning her away, right? No, 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 go, don't come here. You are a Syrophoenician woman. You, you, you are not a Gentile. You are not a Jew. And finally, when she got Christ's attention, what did Jesus Christ tell her? It's like he turned and looked at her. Well, let me tell you, it is not right for me to take the food of the children and give it to the dogs. What could she have done? She has faith that this guy will heal my daughter, my child. And she came and she praised the onslaught of the disciples who are keeping out, shushing her away. And then Jesus Christ said, <laughs> you know, you people are dogs, okay? You people are dogs. And you see, these are children. And I can't take what I'm supposed to give to the children and give to you. They're dogs. The woman said, more like, she's like, I'm paraphrasing my words now. You know what? I accept. Yeah, we are dogs. But please, even the tiny crumbs, if they fall to the ground as we are feeding the children, I would be happy if you just give me some of that. Now that was passion. All consuming passion. See, passion discounts everything else and focuses on that which is important. It makes faith move from the mediocre, the one that is great. Worship without passion. Faith without passion. It's like sacrifices without smoke. So we need to actually have a passion for how God wants us to be. The things he wants us to do. How we should relate with one another. And that passion is what will transform our faith from ordinary faith, logical, reasonable faith in a sense, to one that is living and all-consuming. Our faith in the way we react and relate and respond to our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, whether they offend us, whether they don't offend us, whether they treat us well, they don't treat us well, must smoke. It must be all-consuming according to the word of God. So we must have passion to try to live as one wants us to live. So somebody offends me and I react in a way that shows I am angry and annoyed and I react, I shouldn't, I didn't say, you know what? I leave it in God's hand. Let God be the judge. 
We need to recognize, okay, I could have been better. I was angry, I was annoyed. Yeah, it was just, it was provocative. I was provoked. I mean, I've absorbed this for a long while, but I just couldn't take it anymore. But I didn't react as God expects me to react. And I'm sorry, God. God, please help me to be better. See, passion to the point where we want it to be all encompassing. That every time we react out of tune, we go back to God and say, God, I need you to help me to be better. We must have passion to act the way God wants us to act. So our actions and reactions must smoke. Second area where we can let our lives smoke as living sacrifice to God is in the passion for the word of God. Passion for the word of God. We memorize songs. We memorize names of our favorite actors, maybe players. There are those who will mention all the 11 players or 22 players in both Manchester United and blah, 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 and uh, I think Liverpool. I used to think Liverpool was just a station. I know Manchester and uh, Arsenal. Yeah, Arsenal. Have you heard Manchester Arsenal? I know Liverpool. <laughs> so, but how many people truly know God's word? Actually struggle to study and let this be in them. Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ. Let is an active one again. That, that talks about consciousness involved, a conscious action. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all its richness and abundance, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in us. So, a latest song is released by a favorite actress or entertainer. And we download it. And we listen to it. And we hunt for the lyrics. And we memorize the lyrics. And we know when a new player has been hired to play for a particular team. Or a movie is acted and we know the names of all the key actors. And we even not just know the names of the key actors. We in fact we know all their lives. When they married. When they divorce, how many times they married, how many times they divorce, number of children, how much they are worth, you know, the color of their hair, the size of this of their room, every mini, itsy bitsy, tiny, weeny details about their lives, we know. But when we come to the word of God, I know that you know somewhere, I know somewhere in the Bible, you know, there's something is like this. Oh, but we don't want to know. And somebody comes to us and asks, like Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, be ready to give an answer. When you talk about sanctify the Lord in your heart. Separate him, let him have a special place in your heart. Nothing else come before. And somebody says, please, can you explain to me why this was so? Well, I know, well, I can't really tell you actually where, but I know that somewhere that so, 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 so like this. But let me ask you about who is, can you tell, what do you know about this actress or this player? Oh, he's number 11. In fact, he's the right midfielder of the second clinic of the club. This. In fact, in 19 so so and so, he scored two goals for this. And then, you know that guy is worth 12 million for this so so and so and so. And you know that he actually donated so so and so. Ah, we can relive his entire life history. That's a passion. I've seen people talking about football teams, Manchester United and Arsenal. And now Liverpool and the rest of them. Now I know there are 20 football leagues. So I've done some research. <laughs> <laughs> and they talk about them. Forget about it. No! This one, no, no, no. Okay, what of this person that did this? Okay, this one got in this boy, in this man, they played this one. He filled it. And they will talk with passion. They will buy the t shirt. They will have the car. I mean, memorabilia and various things that represent their favorite actors or actresses or teams. If they probably have a Bible, it might be one old Bible they've not touched in ages. If they even have a Bible, as I listen, I was going to say phone. 
It's just probably the least Bible they had. No Bible help. There's no way they can find out, okay, what is the root meaning of this word? The word law, for example, in the Bible, is used in, it has different words in the New Testament. You have agape, you have filio, you have arrows. But they just know it's law. There is no Bible help. Have they ever heard of what is called a concordance? Or a commentary? They don't know. You must have a passion for the things of God as we collect information and learn about things that we value, people we value, movies, entertainment of various kinds, you know, sports. Let us also have a passion for knowing and understanding the things of God. Then it is smoking, actually. Let the passion consume us. Let it smoke to God. So we will love God. We study His Word. Well, if we're only having little time, limited time to study them, to so try to let them be in us. Remember Matthew 4.4. 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Every word. How is that possible? If we're not consumed with passion for the Word of God, to so study it and to watch how it impacts our lives. Do you know that it's possible to be breaking the law of man and not know you are breaking the law of man because you don't even know it's against the law? What if they have made a law that you should not drive and be eating? There was a time when they wanted to pass that into law. I don't know whether they are passing into law now or not. But what if they not pass that into law? Driving and eating is a crime. The fact that you do not know does this stop any policeman from arresting someone if they find that you are breaking that law? There are places now in Lagos and probably across the nation that is de that's been deemed one way. When you are leaving Egbeda and going to Ikeja or Akomajo side, that Akomajo bridge, the Pemu bridge or Akomajo bridge, they call it, from 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you cannot go up the way you, are, you would normally do in the morning. From 3 o'clock till early morning, you cannot go up. It's now both ways of the bridge. Vehicles can come only this way. They can't go this way. You know, it took time before I saw that small sign. It's a very tiny one written there from 3 o'clock. But you know how many people will have passed that road? Because they normally pass there all on a regular basis. If you are even passing there at 310, not knowing that, maybe your watch is 15 minutes late, and you think, oh, it's just 10 minutes to, I'm so safe, and you pass there three times. The NASMA people or police will just stop you there. Three o'clock, you're not supposed to pass here. Hey, my watch is slow. Does that make a difference? So how can we even know how we're supposed to act? How we're supposed to respond? What we're supposed to do if we don't even know what God expects us to do? So we must not only have a passion for doing that which God wants us to do, responding, reacting the way he wants us. We must have a passion for studying his word, for letting it be in us. Because that's the only way it can constantly be helping us to grow. We must have that passion, we must be strong. I have not read God's word today. I want to go through the Bible in 90 days. I want to go through the Bible in three months, in six months, in one year. I want to study the Bible in different Bibles so that I can get the different nuances of the word and understand how it is. I want to have a thorough understanding of what the word of God. Let me give you an instance. There's a portion of scripture I read earlier, 1 Peter 3.15. It says in the New King James, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. How can you give a defense if you don't even understand what you're supposed to know. But let me read it in the Amplified Version of the Bible. The Amplified Version of the Bible says, But in your hearts, set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging Him, giving Him first place in your lives as Lord. Now, it's the same thing I'm reading, but the Amplified Version is doing what? It's expanding the meaning of that same word. Do we have that passion to get the true, full, expanded, full meaning of the, the Word of God by comparing words in different translations so that the meaning can soak in and can 
help us again with the Spirit of God to be able to apply them in our lives. Then he continues, says, always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and confident assurance elicited by faith that is within you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. You notice again, the same thing, but in a slightly different way that again expands the meaning. So you must have a passion for the Word of God. Third area, we can actually let it smoke and let us be consumed by passion for things of God. It's in repentance. We must let our lives be one of constantly repenting. Oh, I repented a long time ago. I'm, you know, people will use the word, I've been born again, I'm a Christian, I've been baptized. You guess what? The life of a Christian is one that is constantly repenting. John said, if we say we have no sin, we are liars and the truth is not in us. And what should somebody who has sinned be doing? They should repent of it, isn't it? So we must have a passion for repentance, for being willing to constantly be corrected by the word of God and changing. Asking God to help us to continue to renew us. Our spiritual journey requires that we constantly are repenting. It's like when you are driving a car. Have you ever seen a driver who is driving even on a straight road, seemingly straight road, and the driver can remove his hand from the steering and the vehicle will continue going straight? Even on a straight road, drivers make slight cost corrections, isn't it? You keep making small, small corrections. So there are times when, as children of God, we will respond well. And there are times when we will not respond so well. There are times when we will act well. There are times when we won't. There are times when we will talk well. There are times when we won't. Constantly being aware that we are not yet perfect, and yet God expects us to be perfect, will help us to constantly study God's word, and as we read it, and as we hear it, as we see it being pointed out to us, we will take it and apply it in our lives and be changing. There are too many people in the world who will listen to the Word of God or will listen to words being expounded to them, the correction from the Word of God being given to them, and they are listening with the air to respond and to defend. All they are hearing is, as soon as they are hearing, they are willing to listen, but they are ready to quickly dissect. To dissect it is not because they want to understand it. That's not it. The Bereans hear the Word, they will go and study to see whether that is so. These are listening to be able to pull apart, look for some holes, for some excuses, for some justification. They are not listening to see how, okay, let me look at this and examine myself and see whether this actually applies. They are already looking to just poke holes in it and pull it apart. They are not ready to listen to thus says the Lord. And to see it and say, okay, this is what it says, this is what it says. Am I going to really say, am I really saying this is how I am applying myself to this? They are listening with the air to simply just what? Criticize and defend and excuse and justify. Rather than listening to learn and see whether they can correct their life. So we must have a passion for repentance. Our lives must smoke. It must be consumed by constantly being willing to grow. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. That mindset that I constantly need correction. I need help learning to keep growing in the grace of God and in the knowledge of God. And all of us do. And the only way that happens is as we're listening to one another, as we study God's word, and we're allowing the Spirit of God to be yield. Again, God has responsibilities and talents and gifts and skills that he has given to allow us within the body of Christ to actually correct ourselves, to edify ourselves, to teach ourselves, so that we keep growing in repentance from one level to the other. So we must have that passion for repentance. I've mentioned three areas now, three passions. Areas we can actually be consumed with zeal for the things of God, such that we are offering sacrifices that are smoking to God, that we are consumed by it. The best part of us we are putting in there. I talked about the things we do, the way we react, we respond, we relate. I talked about the Word of God and how we must have a passion for studying it and letting it be a deep, integral part of us to correct us. 
And of course, the next step is we must constantly be correcting ourselves, repenting on a regular basis as we study the God's word, as we listen and strive to live according to every word that comes out of his mouth. The fourth area, we must have a passion for the body of Christ, for the church. We must have a passion for the church. I've mentioned this several times. Christ didn't come to die for you or for me. He came to die for mankind. It's a collective. And in this day and age, in this era, Christ, God, they are working with the body of Christ. The believers is not one person. It's not just me. Sometimes we think it's just me. Well, it's just me and God. But you think God says it's not just you and me. It's you and the people of God with me. Imagine if in a family, one member says, you know, I just love mommy and daddy. I know mommy loves me and I know daddy loves me. It's they are the only ones I want to relate with. I don't want to have anything to do with my sister or my brother. I don't want to have, I don't want to have anything to do with them. Everybody mind their own business. I wake up in the morning, good morning sister, good morning brother. That's all the relationship I want to have with my brother and my sister. I don't want wahala. How many of you have had brothers and sisters who don't sometimes make you feel like <laughs> you ever have, you have a brother, you have a sister, and sometimes you don't feel like ah, mm, or you quarrel with your brother, or you quarrel with your sister. Okay, ah, I'm a peaceful person. I don't like wahala. Ah, this is my sister's wahala is too much. I beg, look, stay in your own corner of your house. When you pass me as I'm going to the toilet, all I expect from you is good morning. If I don't even give me good morning, I'm okay. No problem. All I owe you is to say good morning, good morning. That's all. Mind your own business, mind your own business. As long as I love daddy and I love mommy. How long do you think your parents will be happy with that? Family must get along, isn't it? We need to have a passion for the people of God, for the church of God. Because Christ had passion for it. You know, selfishness is nothing that Christ wanted. John 17. We need to read this. I'm trying to minimize the time reading by just paraphrasing the scripture. But we need to read John 17, verse 20. This was close to the time when Christ knew he was going to be arrested. And look at what was consuming him. Look at what was going up in his mind, going on in his mind. The passion he had for the church, for the body, for his people. I do not pray for this alone. John 17, 20. But also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, verse 22, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Made perfect in one. That the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. God doesn't just love me or you. He loves all of us. His children. His people. His church, his body. So we need to have a passion that will consume us for one another. How is this person doing? I haven't connected with the body recently. I want to connect. I want to know what's happening. We need to have a passion for one another. And not just focusing on us. It must consume us. Remember that faith without passion is like sacrifice that doesn't smoke. Sacrifice that doesn't smoke. We must be consumed with passion for the church. And finally, we must also have a passion for prayer. We must have a passion for prayer. See, prayer is like the juice or the fuel, so to say, that fires up, that keeps us charged up. A couple of days ago, 
I had a visitor who visited. And we got talking about some of the problems we have in the country. And he mentioned that it seems our life situation is improving. That in the place where he lives, they now have two days on, one day off. There are times when if you have power for three hours in a day, I will be happy and say, wow, never tried today. Three hours in a day. But now, we have power off, maybe for one hour. Sometimes there are times when for an entire week, the power goes off and in less than 10 minutes, the power is back. And then, so I told him there is really improvement. But for me, because I also have inverter in the house, and I have solar panels on the roof, we don't really see that difference that, oh, there's no power for a number of hours. Because it's like, power goes off, we just say blink, and their power is there. The way I know that the power is improving is that there are times when, before, when we use inverter, from evening or from morning till evening, and then there's no lights, that was for most of the day. By the time we use inverter all through the night, around 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, when we wake up, we hear the inverter beeping. And then by 7 o'clock, the inverter goes off. So we know that, oh, they did not bring lights all through the night. So the inverter did not charge. Okay? There was a time when the charging system of the inverter had issues. The, the way it works is that when the sun is up, the solar panels will work and they will charge the battery. When there is NEPA, the batteries also have been charged by NEPA. NEPA will charge the batteries faster than the solar panels will. If the panels are, if the battery is drained, it takes at least six hours of you not using power at all and the batteries will charge up. But of course, we are always constantly using power. So it doesn't charge up as quickly as when there is light, okay? When the batteries, uh, when the charging system was bad, even though there is light 24 seven, or there is light for 10 hours, and the solar panels are there also, working during the day, the moment light goes off, instead of the battery being charged, so that we continue to have power, five minutes, everything is off. So we have to use change. Prayer is like, the charge that keeps the batteries charged. When we do not pray, it's like we're not charging up. Okay? We're losing, we're getting drained. You know, sometimes a battery gets so drained, which happens, sometimes I don't drive out these days. I'm working in the office. And I have to remember to keep charging the vehicle every single day. That's what you ask job now. Go and start the vehicle in the morning, 15 minutes. And then later I'll tell him, do it in the morning and the evening too. 15, 20 minutes every, twice a day. You know, if he forgets to charge, to, to warm that battery at least twice a day, you know, the next day, he didn't want me throughout today. You know, the next day when he tries to start the engine, you just say, it won't start. The battery is getting drained, it's flat. We now have to go and get the generator battery and use it to jumpstart the battery. Consider prayer like that. Every single day you do not pray. Every day we leave our homes, we don't pray to God. Our charge is getting lower. And every time we pray, our charge gets strong. If I take the vehicle out, and I drive for like an hour, two hours, three hours that day, both going and coming. Two days if I don't want that battery. The battery is okay. The more time you spend in prayer, the more charge we get spiritually. The less time we spend in prayer, the less charge our lives get. We need to have a passion for constantly charging ourselves, connecting ourselves back to God, constantly connecting ourselves. We must have that passion for prayer. And it's the only way we can continue to improve and to grow. Incidentally, God knows that. 
and he's ready to give us all the joys we want, but we need to connect. So we need to have a passion for prayers. In summary, brethren, when God asks Israelites of old to offer sacrifices to him, like he has asked us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, he told the priest then, cut out all the fats, all the important areas, the entrails, the flank, the meat, remove all the fats and burn them and let the fire consume them and let them come up as a smoking, sweet-smelling savour to him. They should make the sacrifices smoke by giving him the best parts of it, the fatty parts of it. Ourselves too. God expects us to give him the best part of our lives. And the five areas that we can actually be giving God the best part is in the way we relate our actions, our reactions, our relations to one another must be con consumed in such a way that it's as God wants it to be. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ, said Paul. So we must be consumed with passion to act as God wants. We must be consumed with passion for the word of God to let it grow in us, to let it be in us richly to understand it. We must be consumed with passion to repent daily, constantly. We must be consumed with passion for the church, for the body. We must be consumed with passion for prayer, talking to God. And that is how we can make our life smoke and be consumed with zeal for God. Shabbat Shalom.